Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. One of the first controversies encountered by most students of Western music is the problem of C flat. Like any other flat, this is the note a half step below C natural. But if you look at a piano, there's no black key below C, which means C flat is the same note as B. Right? I mean, they sound the same, and you play them the same way. And yet your teacher is probably insisting that they're different somehow. And annoyingly, this doesn't go away. Bringing this question up in a room full of professional musicians is a great way to start a fight. Lots of people have very strong opinions about whether B and C flat are different notes, and they're all wrong. I'm right. So when my friend and sworn nemesis Adam Neely decided to weigh in on the debate, I decided to use it as an opportunity to explain why the answer to this question isn't yes or no. The correct answer, the only correct answer, is it depends. Basically, this is a question about enharmonic equivalence. When we have two note names that describe the same pitch, we call those notes enharmonic. They have the same harmony. B and C flat are clearly enharmonic. Pretty much everyone agrees on that. But does that mean they're the same? Adam argues it doesn't, and to be fair, he's right. He presents a pretty convincing argument against enharmonic equivalence, demonstrating multiple contexts in which the distinction between B and C flat matters. But that's the thing I think is missing here. Context. As the one making the video, Adam is in complete control of the context in which these notes are presented, and is thus able to select ones where the difference is both obvious and important. Which, to be clear, is fine. I'm not saying he's trying to trick you, he's just using good examples. But every example has its limits, so for the sake of providing a more complete picture, I'd like to consider some context where that difference doesn't really apply. Adam's first argument is about functions. In the context of Western tonal music, the name we use for a note communicates not just what pitch we expect to hear, but also what we expect that pitch to do. If I play a D major triad, it'd be weird to ask for a G flat on top of it. Not because it wouldn't sound good, but because considering the function the note is performing in this chord, it makes a lot more sense to call it F sharp. And Adam argues, correctly, that this can apply to C-flat as well. An important rule about note functions is that if you're playing in a key and you hit a note outside that key, we expect it to resolve in the direction of its alteration. That is, if you're in E-flat, then B is the sharp 5, which wants to resolve up to C, while C-flat is the flat 6, which wants to resolve down to B-flat. And that might sound pedantic, but it's not. This is a real, meaningful distinction, and experienced musicians will approach these two notes differently. Again, Adam demonstrates that pretty convincingly in his video. There are plenty of tonal contexts where it is important to distinguish between B and C flat, because they require different treatments from the performer. But are there any contexts where insisting on that distinction causes a problem? I think so. A while back, I was invited to do a cameo in the Vsauce 3 series Could You Survive the Movies. They brought me in to talk about sound for their episode on A Quiet Place, link in the description. During filming, they asked me to ad-lib some technical-sounding music theory jargon, and this is what I came up with. Hey, 12-tone! Oh, sorry, I was working on a really tricky modulation. Hey, you wouldn't happen to know a good pivot chord from E to B-flat, would you? Now, am I bringing this up just to show off that I've been in a Vsauce 3 video? Of course, I'm trying to start drama here. How many Vsauce 3 videos has Adam been in? None. Probably. I haven't fact-checked that. But conveniently, the question I asked there wasn't gibberish. It's a fairly standard theory problem, and while Jake didn't know the answer, I do. First, a little background. A pivot chord is a technique for smoothing out key changes. Basically, you use a chord that belongs in both your starting key and your target key, so that for at least a moment, you're kind of in both at the same time. So, like, if you're in the key of E major, going straight to D major might sound jarring, but you can pivot through the shared A major triad. But that requires there to B shared chords, which can be tricky. In my question to Jake, I asked about the keys of E major and B flat major. These have no chords in common. In fact, if we don't count in harmonics, they only have one note in common, so if we want a pivot chord, we're gonna have to get fancy. We won't find a perfect pivot, but there are some chords that at least have some function in both keys, and the most obvious one is B7. In E major, this is the 5 chord, which strongly resolves back to 1. Easy. In B flat major, though, it's what's called the tritone substitution. This is where you take the 5 chord, in this case F7, and replace it with another dominant 7th chord whose root is a tritone away. This works for various technical reasons I don't feel like getting into right now, but I'll put an explanation on screen so you can pause if you're curious. Point is, if you're okay with spicy harmonies, you can resolve to the 1 chord by playing a dominant 7th built on the flat 2nd of the key, in this case C flat 7. 
And there you have it. This chord can step in to fill the gap between two very distant keys, but it can only do that if B and C flat are the same note. Otherwise, we're stuck with two completely different chords that just happen to sound the same. The pivot doesn't work because the chord isn't shared between the two keys, and yet... I mean, it does work. You can do this, and it sounds fine. I wrote an example piece to demonstrate, but it wound up a little long for this video because I had to clearly establish both keys, so I'll post it over on my Mastodon page if you want to check it out. Now, there is a way to fix this. All we have to do is say this chord stays B7, but instead of changing to B flat major, we're moving to the very popular key of A sharp major, home to such beloved notes as E sharp, C double sharp, and F double sharp. But if you're a session musician, you show up at a gig, and they hand you some sheet music with this key signature instead of this one, are you really going to appreciate that it's a more technically accurate way of communicating the tonal nuances of the modulation? Probably not. In this context, enharmonic equivalence makes everyone's lives a whole lot easier. Generally speaking, I'd say the distinction between B and C flat matters a lot in diatonic space, that is, the space within a single clearly established key. But it rarely matters in chromatic space, the space between keys. That's why it broke in our last example. The whole point of a pivot chord is that it changes functions partway through. But the problem isn't limited to key changes, we can see it in other chromatic contexts as well. Consider this famous run from Phantom of the Opera. What's this note supposed to be? We're in D minor, so this is a non-diatonic tone that moves up by half-step to C. It's B. Cool. But what about the other run? Here, that same pitch is a non-diatonic tone that moves down by half-step to B-flat. It's C-flat. And sure, you can call it that. This isn't a situation where the two notes need to be the same. I picked this example specifically because there is a valid argument for using C-flat. It's exactly the sort of situation where enharmonic purists will insist that's the right thing to do. But if you look up transcriptions of this song, no one does it. Even the official licensed sheet music calls this a B. The point of using a specific name is to communicate a specific function, and in this sort of chromatic run, the functions of the middle notes don't matter. They're not meant to be heard in relation to the key, they're just filling in space between the two harmonically relevant notes on either end. When that happens, the convention is to just pick whichever note name is easier. You may have noticed that I called this note D flat going down, but C sharp going up. That's standard practice because it reduces the number of accidentals I have to include. If I call this C-sharp, then I have to add a natural sign to this C to prevent the sharp from carrying over, and I don't want to write that if I don't have to. And for black key notes, where you need an accidental either way, that's all there is to it. But for white key notes like this one, there's another factor to consider. Familiarity. Most musicians spend a lot more time thinking about B than C-flat. B is an important note in a lot of common keys like C major, A major, and E minor. C-flat, on the other hand, only comes up in a couple pretty esoteric keys like G-flat, so you're probably not as used to playing it. If you're as experienced as Adam, that may not be a problem, but if you're not, and most people aren't, then if I ask you to play a C-flat, it'll probably take you an extra split second to remember where that is on your instrument. In fact, you might just translate it to B first and then play that instead. That extra effort makes the notation harder to read, so unless I have a really good reason to do it, I can communicate what I want much more clearly without losing any musical nuance by just calling my C-flats Bs. Is it wrong? Sure. Whatever. But is it more useful? Yeah. And to really drive this point home, let's look at one more example. Let's consider what some have called the most elegant key change in all of pop music, Celine Dion's All By Myself. This song is mostly in G major, but for the final chorus it modulates to… well, that's the question. In his video on this song, Adam argues that it modulates to C flat major because over the transition, Dion holds an E flat. <laughs> This is the flat 6 in G, which transforms into the major 3rd in C flat. If we were modulating to B, we'd have to call this D sharp. That would make it the sharp 5 in G, which isn't the right function, so C flat it is. Cool. Makes sense to me. But as a thought experiment, what would happen if we played the song down a major 3rd? Now the starting key is E flat, the pivot note is C flat, and C flat is the third in the key of A double flat major. And, I mean, I can't speak for Adam. Maybe he would still insist on using the technically precise name here. I doubt it, but 
I don't know. What I can tell you, though, with absolute certainty is that I, and probably most other musicians, would just call it G, with this note simultaneously serving as C-flat in the old key and B in the new one. The added precision of keeping the spelling consistent on this one note isn't worth the added complication for the rest of the section. But if we're not willing to call it A-double-flat, then is it really that important to say the original song went to C-flat? Like, it's not wrong. It's just not clear to me why it's necessary. That's the touchy-feely argument, but I know you're all waiting for me to talk about math. On the surface, Adam's argument about tuning sounds pretty definitive. In effect, he argues that outside of our modern 12-tone equal temperament system, these two notes are physically different. And yeah, that's true. Here, Adam is relying on the concept of just intonation. This is a really old idea in European music dating back to everyone's favorite triangle boy, Pythagoras. Actually, it probably dates back even further. There's good evidence that some version of this idea was used by the Babylonians, but our modern understanding of it can be traced pretty directly to the ancient Greeks. Anyway, just intonation says that consonants is the result of playing notes whose frequencies form a nice, simple ratio. For example, the just intonation octave is defined as a 1 to 2 ratio, and important for our story, the major third has a ratio of 4 to 5. Now, to find an exact frequency, we're gonna need a reference pitch. Adam chooses E flat, which has a fundamental frequency of around 311 hertz. Amber is the color of your energy. Uh huh. Anyway, if we take that note and go up two major thirds with their 4 to 5 ratios, we find that B should have a frequency of 486 hertz. On the other hand, if we take E flat, go up an octave, then down a major third, we get to C flat with a frequency of 498. Those are different numbers, and thus different pitches. Case closed. 12 tone has been defeated in the marketplace of ideas. But... Why are we using major thirds? That's not the only interval, it's not even the simplest. The perfect fifth has a ratio of 2 to 3. If we go up two perfect fifths, then down an octave, we get a whole step with a ratio of 8 to 9. If we start on E flat and walk up in whole steps, we get F, G, A, and B, but this time the frequency is... 498 hertz exactly the same as C-flat. Or, okay, not exactly the same, I rounded them both to the nearest whole number. They're actually about half a hertz apart, or for the tuning theorists out there, a little under two cents. But practically speaking, these are the same note. Now, this isn't actually a fair comparison. If we do the same whole step thing down to C-flat, we get 491 hertz, which is, again, slightly different. But my actual point is that just intonation doesn't give us pitches. It only gives us intervals, and it gives us infinitely many of those. Another approach we could have taken is to decide that starting from E-flat is silly. After all, if we just go up a perfect fifth to B-flat, both the notes we're looking for are a half step away. But just intonation has a couple different kinds of half steps. The chromatic half-step, typically defined as a ratio of either 24 to 25 or 128 to 135, is what you use when you don't want to change letters in your note name. This takes us from B-flat to B, which is either 486 or 492 hertz. The diatonic half-step, either 15 to 16 or 25 to 27, does change letters to C-flat, with a frequency of 498 or 503. And all of this is without even going above 5-limit tuning, which... Nope. Not getting into that. This video is long enough already. Point is, there's not one specific just intonation value each for B and C flat. There's infinitely many, depending on how you choose to define these notes in relation to the reference pitch, and these different methods don't even all agree on which one is supposed to be higher. The difference between the lowest and highest C flats we found is about the same as the difference between the B and C flat that Adam mentions, and yet we don't give each of them their own name. Not because the math says we shouldn't, but because accounting for every possible tuning context is a massive headache that doesn't actually result in clearer notation or better music. We have to draw the line somewhere, and there's nothing inherent to the numbers that says we need to leave space for C-flat. But my bigger issue here is relying on just intonation in the first place. There's this thing that happens a lot in tuning theory circles, including some of my older videos on the topic, where everyone takes for granted the idea that just intonation is the good intervals. Those are the correct definitions, and any deviation from them is some sort of compromise. And this can get really heated. There are people who will argue with a straight face that equal temperament is an abomination that destroyed harmony and ruined music for centuries because of what it does to the just intonation major third. 
Yikes. Adam's not going nearly that far, though, and I don't think the claims he's making are unreasonable. But by framing the question of tuning entirely around just intonation, he maybe accidentally implies that those are the same thing. And to be fair, there are some studies indicating that our preference for these simple frequency ratios is innate. Maybe we're born with it. But there's other studies that say we're not. Music cognition research is hard because the human brain is complicated. And to save everyone some time, yes, I've seen the studies they did with the Chimane people of the Amazon. Amazon. I've also seen the criticisms. You don't have to email me about it, I already know. But even if we're willing to assume that the preference is innate, which… ugh. But even in that case, the choice to prioritize it over other aesthetic concerns is still a choice, and it's not a universal one. Take gamelan, for instance. This is a traditional orchestral style of music in various Indonesian cultures, most notably Java and Bali, and it sounds like this. <laughs> Gamelan instruments are typically tuned using one of two systems, slendro or pelog, neither of which is even trying to align itself with just intonation ratios. But the key feature here is that, unlike in Western tuning, these pitches vary. Individual instruments are tuned to match their ensemble, but there's no universally agreed upon tuning standards shared between different orchestras and instrument makers. And this isn't just an issue of absolute pitch, that's part of it, but they also vary in terms of relative pitch. Individual notes may be higher or lower in different ensembles, resulting in different intervals. Not even the octave is consistent. Most of the time it's either wider or smaller than the supposedly perfect 1 to 2 ratio, and ensembles also vary the precise tuning of their intervals in different registers. Now, I don't want to present myself as more of an expert on gamelan than I am. I've read a fair bit about it over the years, but this isn't my culture, and I can't speak for it. But I can say that gamelan is a style of music with a long, rich tradition and history, along with its own established standards of musical beauty, that make no sense if you insist on viewing it through the lens of just intonation. It's doing a different thing with different priorities, and the resulting decisions about tuning are just as valid as the ones that Europeans made. But admittedly, because it's not a European system, gamelan music doesn't include a lot of C flats, so to get back to the topic at hand, let's turn our attention to another system that's a little closer to home. 12-tone equal temperament. It's true that, historically, European tuning systems have attempted to replicate just intonation intervals, but by the late 1700s they largely switched to a new system that traded those perfect ratios for a different aesthetic priority. Symmetry. While just intonation has at least four different kinds of half-steps, equal temperament has one, and that opens up some really exciting possibilities. If you were in, say, mean tone temperament, another 18th century tuning system that explicitly maintained the just intonation major third, then the question I asked earlier about changing keys from E major to B flat major wouldn't make sense. You couldn't do it. To play in both those keys, you'd need a D sharp and an E flat, and a standard mean tone keyboard only has one of those. But once you switch to equal temperament, all the keys are the same, opening up tons of opportunities to play around in chromatic space. In response, over the course of the 19th century, European music saw a dramatic rise in both the frequency and the distance of key changes. And that was just the beginning. Ideas like free atonality, post-tonality, neo-Riemannian harmony, 12-tone serialism, the whole tone scale, the Lydian chromatic concept, even the tritone substitutions we talked about earlier all rely on the symmetrical nature of equal temperament. And when Adam talks about moving in major thirds, specifically between E flat, G, and B, I find it hard not to think of giant steps, John Coltrane's infamous exploration of those three simultaneous key centers. Coltrane takes advantage of the inherent symmetry of the equal-tempered major third in order to bounce around between three very different tonalities at breakneck speed. Could you do that in just intonation? Sure, but it'd be a very different piece of music. Giant steps as it exists only make sense if you accept that B and E flat are a major third apart. More broadly, the idea that equal temperament is merely a harmonic compromise, not a rich musical tradition in its own right, seems ahistorical to me, and I don't see why we have to accept that the just intonation intervals are somehow more intrinsically correct. Yes, if we define a major third as a 4 to 5 frequency ratio, then the note two major thirds above E flat is different than the note a major third below it. In that context, it makes perfect sense to use the names B and C flat to communicate that distinction. But if we instead define a major third as exactly 
exactly one third of an octave, which is an equally valid definition that more accurately reflects the majority of modern Western musical practice, the difference evaporates, and I think it's fair to recognize that too. Now, Adam argues that while we no longer actually use just intonation, we still carry with us some of the harmonic and melodic vocabulary of older traditions that did, and so the shadows of those traditions can still be found in our music. And yeah, I'll grant him that, but it's not like we haven't developed any new vocabularies since the 18th century. So while he's completely correct that the difference between B and C flat is very real and very important outside of 12-tone equal temperament, I'd find that argument a lot more compelling if it weren't for the fact that the vast majority of the music written in staff notation or related systems over the last 250 years or so has been written for equal-tempered instruments. Not all of it, of course. Some modern styles, like barbershop quartets, do still use just intonation, but anything that's ever been within 500 feet of a piano doesn't, and hasn't for a very long time. Ultimately, I do agree with most of Adam's conclusion. Western music has a long, complicated history building on top of itself over thousands of years, and that organic process has left us with a lot of weird-looking baggage. Attempts by non-experts to remove that baggage and streamline the system may be well-intentioned, but they often miss the nuances of why that baggage was there in the first place. Sometimes things serve a purpose, even when that purpose isn't immediately obvious. But sometimes they don't, at least not anymore, and I think that part of being a good teacher and a good communicator is recognizing when baggage is just baggage. Everything we do can be justified. That doesn't mean everything we do has a point. Adam argues that music is complicated and messy, so we need a complicated, messy system to describe it, and he's right. But if anything, I think he's underestimating that messiness by insisting that any single, consistent, inflexible vocabulary is always going to be correct. And that's why I find this whole debate kind of frustrating. Because here's the thing. B and C flat aren't real. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not descending into solipsism here. This pitch is real. It has a fundamental frequency of around 494 hertz. We can measure that. But it exists on an infinite spectrum of measurable frequencies. The only reason this one has a name is that we decided it would be useful to give it one. It's a notational convenience. But when we argue whether B and C flat are the same note, we take it for granted that there must be a correct answer. We treat it like a fact, but it's not. It's a decision, and it doesn't have to be consistent. These notes are different when we want them to be different, and they're the same when it's more useful for them to be the same. That's not a contradiction, it's just efficient use of tools. Consider this, why is the conversation always about B and C flat? We could ask all the same questions about F sharp and A triple flat. But we don't. Not because any of the arguments don't apply there, but because, like, come on. Be reasonable. Obviously, one of these is way more useful. On the other side, the debate around F-sharp and G-flat is equally uninteresting because they're both equally useful. There's no reason to favor one over the other, so we accept that both are valid. C-flat exists somewhere between those two extremes. It's more useful than A-triple-flat, but less useful than G-flat. It doesn't come up often, but it does come up. And that means there will always be people correctly insisting that you need to recognize the difference, and other people who also correctly don't care. B and C flats aren't things. They're ideas, and without context, those ideas are useless. So next time someone tries to start this fight with you, do me a favor. Look them dead in the eyes and ask why they need to know. If they can't answer that, just leave. It's not worth your time. Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Kevin Wilimowski, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Grant Aldonis, and Damian Fuller Sutherland. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.